Thank you, Corby. There is a catchphrase that is having a huge impact on our world today. Two words, cancel culture. If you don't like it, cancel it. And it's having an impact on our, on our history, on our businesses, on people. However, now listen carefully. God is calling us to something drastically different than that. When it comes to God and his word, there is one word, unwavering. God is absolutely unwavering about his word, and he wants us to be unwavering about him. And for the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of the things that we need to be unwavering about. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the very first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And as you turn there, let me ask you a question. When you think of God, what do you see? I mean, when you think of God, what do you see? And the reason I say that is... In your notes, I begin in that box, with that box. You don't get four words into the Bible before you're faced with a crucial task. You don't get beyond four words, and you and I are confronted with a very critical, crucial task. Genesis 1, 1, the first four words. In the beginning, God. Well, who is God? I mean, if you were picking up the Bible today for the very first time, had never read it, didn't know anything about it, had never heard the word God, and those first four words, in the beginning, before there was a creation, in the beginning, God, what would you think? Well, the rest of the Bible gives us an understanding of exactly who God is. Let me ask you another question. What's the number one most important thing about you? Be honest with yourself. What's the number one most important thing about you? It's not what you do for a living. It's not how much you have or how much you make. It's not who you're married to. It's not, not what family you are a part of. The number one most important thing about you is how you view God. Because if you're wrong on that one, then your view of life is wrong, your view of marriage is wrong, your view of money is wrong, your view of success is wrong. There is a, we are living in a culture today where there is a consistent 21st century message, unfortunately, coming even from pulpits. And that is, the predominant message is the love of God. And I am very grateful that God so loved the world. I'm grateful that before I ever thought of loving God, He loved me. But God commended His love toward me, toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We live in a culture today, though, that wants a, wants a happy God, a, a God that will tolerate sin, a helpful God that will give us a, enough money so that we can satisfy every need. But there's no room in our culture today for a holy God who the Bible says is so pure that he can't look at sin. The book of Habakkuk tells us that. I begin in your notes with one introductory statement, and that is this. Our view of God, our view of God determines our relationship to God. And today we're going to hang on only two major points in the message today, but these two major points are critical. Here's the first one. Number one. We need a fresh glimpse of God's holiness. 
Turn, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. And when you get to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, something important has taken place. In verse number 1 of Isaiah 6, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died. That was an important year. 739 B.C., and Uzziah, one of the great kings of Judah. I mean, Uzziah, he honored God throughout most of the time that he was a king. And because Uzziah honored God, the land and the economy were booming there. And because he honored God, his reign was one of prosperity. His reign was one of protection. Every war that he fought, they won. But then the Bible says that Uzziah died and the people became very discouraged. Despair came over them. And Isaiah says in verse number one, in the year that King Uzziah died, look at the next phrase. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Now notice how Isaiah sees the Lord. The Lord's not pacing back and forth because the great king Uzziah died. He's not nervous. He's not breaking out in a cold sweat. Isaiah said in verse number one, put that back up there. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Look at this. High and lifted up. You see, Isaiah sees some things in that. Number one, he sees that God is sovereign. Isaiah is saying, listen, Isaiah saw crystal clear what we so desperately need to see in these uncertain days. He saw there are two things about the fact of God's sovereignty. Number one, God is on the throne. Listen, the day in which we live you know, the only thing we can compare it to basically as far as experience in our lifetime, it's nothing like we've ever experienced before. I mean, there, you know, and, and, and it's easy for folks to become discouraged or despaired or wondering what's the future going to be like. But let me tell you something today. What matters most is not who's in the White House, but who's on the throne. Don't ever forget that. When you walk out of here today, regardless of what the news says, regardless of what the pandemic, regardless of any new strain that comes, regardless of the statistics, what's most important is not who's in the White House, but who's on the throne. And the second thing Isaiah sees is not only is God on the throne, but God is in absolute control. He's high and lifted up above every ruler, above every problem, above every situation, above every difficulty. He is in absolute control. Do you see the contrast? Uzziah died. The throne in, on the earth is empty. But the throne in heaven is full. Psalm 45, 6 says, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. I put in your notes, God is above all else. But Isaiah saw something else. Isaiah, when God allowed him to see him like Isaiah had never seen him before, Isaiah gets a glimpse of the unrivaled majesty of God. Look at the last phrase. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You know, throughout time, clothes have oftentimes communicated a person's rank or authority. Uh, a bride 
uh, a bride could, I remember Prince, Princess Di, when she was married, that train, it looked like it went from London to Scotland. I mean, it was, it was a long train. Royalty sometimes, as you study history, they connected and they, they competed by the size and the, the beauty of the robes. It established their importance. Isaiah said, God's robe filled the temple. And the imagery that God is getting is that while the earth throne is empty, God is sitting on the throne. And the implication is that God's majesty knows no limits. It dwarfs any human monarch. By the way, something very interesting, it's not in your notes. In verse number one, the word Lord is the Hebrew word Adonai. It's in the lower case. That's not a name for God. That's the title of God. It's the supreme title of God given in the Old Testament. He is the supreme sovereign one. When you get down to later on, I think it's in verse 5, uh, there's the, the word Lord, but that's in the upper case, and that's the word Yahweh. That's the, that's the, 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 sacred name of, of God. The point that Isaiah is making when he says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He said, I saw the supreme sovereign one of the universe. Don't forget that. That's who God is. He is the supreme sovereign one of the universe. And we need to be reminded today you know, you go to an Old Testament passage and you go, okay, listen. Every single thing in God's word can be applied to our life. And in these days, we need to be reminded repeatedly in days of darkness and disappointment and difficulty and doubt and despair. We need to be reminded that God is on the throne and he is in absolute control today. We worry, concerned about, am I going to have a job? Am I going to have this? Am I going to have that? And listen, those things are real. But you got to put them in their proper perspective. Don't major on that. Don't ever forget, regardless of what comes, hell, hell or high water, God is on the throne and he is in absolute control. Israel was discouraged. They were afraid. What are we going to do? Uzziah died. And in the year that he died, Isaiah saw the Lord because God is ready to use Isaiah like never before. And Isaiah had to get a fresh glimpse of God. I dare say that this morning in our worship service, watching live stream, watching during the week, I'm preaching to some folks that that's just what you need. Deep in the resources, you love them. But you've strayed. And you know how you've strayed? you got your eyes. That's why the Bible says, set your affections on things above. Don't forget who's on the throne. And he is in absolute control. Nothing. I may not be able to figure out how it all weaves together, but God has promised. God's promised to weave it all together. For we know that all things, say the word all, all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to the purpose. Isaiah sees something else. Secondly, not only that God is sovereign, but secondly, God is sinless. We need to see that God is sinless. Verse 2, above it stood seraphim. Now, the word seraphim means to burn. And so just to give you a picture of, of these, these angels, these creatures that God has, these seraphims, to burn, what God is saying is they, it's, they have a zeal for the Lord and they, their entire, their, their enti all they do is worship God. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world, earth is full of his glory. Now listen very carefully. Leave those up there. In those two verses right there, folks, we find the most important truth about God in all the Bible. And that is, God is holy. It's not his power that the seraphims are saying and talking about and worshiping about. They're not saying power, power, power. It's not his presence. They don't say I'm omnipresence, omnipresence. It's not his perception. They don't say omniscience, omniscience. They say holy, holy, holy. In other words, what Isaiah saw is that God is absolute perfection. Completely absent in God is even a trace of sin. And God's holiness pervades, pervades his entire being. It shapes all of his other attributes. His love, then, is a holy love. His mercy is a holy mercy. His anger and his wrath is not just something that goes off the cuff. It's a holy anger. It's a holy wrath. Seven of 12 references to the name of God in the Old Testament refer to him as holy. The word holy comes from, a, from the root word goddish, which literally means uh, set apart. You see, it's his holiness that sets him apart. I put in your notes, holiness is what separates. Number one, it's what separates God from man. Hosea said in verse, uh, verse, uh, chapter 11 and verse 9, For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. Holiness is what separates not just God from man, but God from all false gods. Exodus 15. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Nobody. Who is like you, glorious in holiness? Holiness doesn't just separate God from man or all false gods. Thirdly, it's God's holiness. That's what separates God from everyone and everything. Everyone. 1 Samuel 2.2. 2. No one. Say those two words. No one. Say them again. No one. No one is holy like the Lord. Look here. On your best day, on my best day, collectively on our best day. Let's put all of our best days together. None of us, nobody is holy like the Lord. There was a survey done, taken, of seminary students from seven different seminaries. Thousands uh, of seminary students received this survey, and they were asked a question about the God that they were going to serve when they got out of seminary. And the findings were incredible. There were two statements that were given them, and they were given the opportunity to choose which statement they felt was most important about God. 80.3% preferred the statement that said, God's love includes all people. His desire is that all should know him. 80.3% of all the seminary students preferred that to this statement. God is holy. Evil will not triumph. Only 18.5%. The other remaining, 1.2%, believed that they were both equal. The question was designed to investigate the fundamental understanding of God with these, suits, the, the, these seminary students. And by a ratio of more than four to one, they chose the God of love over the God of holiness. Hear me and hear me well. 
our thinking is going to be skewed until we understand and accept the fact that God is the thrice holy God of Israel who hates sin and will one day judge all evil. By the way, did you notice what the seraphim said? Three times, look at verse 3 again. And one cried to another. This is what's going on at the throne that Isaiah sees. They're crying. That's what's happening. And said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You know, when you and I want to emphasize something when we're writing, we underline or we put it in italics or we put it bold or we put an exclamation mark. Hebrew, Hebrews, Jewish people, when they emphasize, they emphasize by repetition. Three times, holy, holy, holy. And by doing that, they elevate that to the supreme degree of greatest importance. And by the way, the only attribute of God in the Bible that is repeated to the third degree is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. He is supreme, and God is on an unsurpassed level. And let me say this, until we begin to understand the holiness of God, we will never understand his other attributes. Until we understand the holiness of God, we're never going to understand his love. We're never going to understand his mercy, his justice, his grace. We need a fresh glimpse of God's holiness. There's a second thing, and that is not only do we need a fresh glimpse of God's holiness, we need a fresh glimpse of our sinfulness. Look at verse 5. Isaiah's writing and he says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. The word woe, by the way, in the Hebrew language, it's an oracle of doom. It is the most severe judgment of, of, uh, of pronouncement. In other words, what Isaiah is saying is that he is pronouncing judgment on himself. You see, when Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness... Let me say it again. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, he saw himself in his sinfulness. And he saw the people in their wickedness. Now what's interesting, folks, is that up until now, Isaiah is working overtime uh, condemning the sin of others. Let me just take you quickly through chapter 5. In chapter 5 and verse 8, woe to those who join house to house to add, they add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night till wine inflames them. Verse 18, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil or evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 22, woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant in mi mixing intoxicating drink. Isaiah, he's giving woe to everyone else, but when he sees the Lord and he gets a fresh glimpse of his holiness, he says, woe is me, for I am undone.
when his soul was placed against the bright, pure holiness of God. His white turned black. His right turned wrong. Now listen very, very carefully. I put in a box in your notes. Until you see God as he really is, you're never going to see yourself as you really are. Look here. You ought, to, you ought to memorize that. Until you see God as he really is, you'll never see yourself as you really are. Because only God can truly tell you what's wrong with you. But once you see his glory, once you see how holy he is, you'll see your own guilt and you'll understand his grace. Two men were on a train. One of them was a preacher and they got in conversation as time went on and the man said to the preacher, how can a, how can a God of love send a man to hell? And the preacher said, how can a God of holiness take a man to heaven? You know, actually, as you're sitting here in our worship service or as you're sitting there in your living room or at your desk or wherever you are watching and viewing this film or listening to it, there's really three people that are sitting in your seat right now. I put it in your notes. Number one, there's the person you hope to be. There's the person you hope you are. Number two, there's the person others think you are. And then there is the person God knows you are. You know, there was a time when Isaiah thought he was a great prophet. His peers considered him the man of unquestionable integrity and Righteousness. But then one glimpse of a holy God is all it took for God to reveal his guilt and for Isaiah to say in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. R.C. Sproul in his book, The Holiness of God, said this, I'd like to read it. If ever there was a man of integrity, it was Isaiah. He was a whole man, a together type of fellow. He was considered by his contemporaries as the most righteous man in the nation. He was respected as a paragon of virtue. Then he caught one sudden glimpse of a holy God. In that single moment, all of his self-esteem was shattered. In a brief second, he was exposed, made naked beneath the gaze of the absolute standard of holiness. As long as Isaiah could compare himself to other mortals, he was able to sustain a lofty opinion of his own character. The instant he measured himself by the ultimate standard, he was destroyed morally and spiritually annihilated. He was undone. He came apart. His sense of integrity collapsed. He saw himself as he really was. And you know what Isaiah did something we don't want to do? In fact, I put it in the note. Isaiah refused to do what we are so prone to do. Excuse his sin. We want to excuse our sin. We want to give a reason for it. We want to try to justify it. Isaiah didn't. And let me say to you today, when you begin to see God as he really is, I promise you, <clears throat> you're going to be able to see yourself as you really are. And the worst thing you can do is try to avoid that. 
One look at a holy God is all it took to reveal to Isaiah how sinful he really was. By the way, don't miss this. <clears throat> Part of Satan's MO, in other words, how Satan and his demons, how they're working against you and me and any believer, one of the ways that they, they try to trip us up, and boy, if they can do this, they'll about let us do anything else. They try to keep us out of this book. Hang with me. You know why? Because this is the only place that God has revealed himself. Where you and I can read every day. We read where God has revealed himself in nature. We read how God revealed himself speaking. And, and if he can keep us out of this book, listen, then we don't get to know God. When I first started preaching, I didn't know any better. When I got into ministry before I became a senior pastor, and then I became a senior pastor, and I, and I thought, I've got, to, I've got to speak multiple times a week. And I studied the Bible to preach messages. And one day, thank goodness, early in my first pastorate, God convicted me, Ken, that's not how you do it. You study the Bible. Not to preach messages, you study the Bible to get to know me. And out of the overflow of what you discover I am, then you begin to preach the message. I have been anything but perfect in my walk with God, but over four decades of walking with the Lord, I want to tell you what I've learned. Maybe as important of a principle that I've ever learned. In fact, I put it because I want you to read it. I want you to think about it. One thing I've learned in my walk with God, the more I know of God, the less I think of me. The more I know of God, the less I think of me. That's a problem with our culture. We go from this to that, looking for a happy God, looking for a helpful God to meet our needs and satisfy every whim. And all along, we wonder why there's a void. Because we don't really know God. Yes, he's a God of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and I am first in line with my thankfulness, but I will tell you, the only, way I, the only way I've ever gotten to know God's love and really understand God's mercy is to know that God is holy, holy, holy. It's interesting as you study the Apostle Paul's life, to see what he felt about himself the longer he lived his Christian life before he was martyred. I put in your notes, shortly after Paul's ministry began, Paul said, number one, I am the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul said, I am the least of the apostles. But Paul grew. Seven years later, Paul makes another statement about himself. It wasn't, I am the least of the apostles. Paul said, secondly, seven years later, I am the least of all the saints. Ephesians 3, verse 8, I am the least of all the saints. But it didn't stop there. 
Three years after that, that he wrote in the book of Ephesians, he's writing to Timothy, and he didn't say, I'm the least of the apostles. He didn't say, I'm the least of all the saints. He said, I am the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the chief of sinners. The Times of London years ago, that was, an, by the way, an, a very elitist newspaper there. It ran a series in the columns of letters to the editor. And they asked people a question, what's wrong with the world? And people wrote letters to the editor one after another, and they would print these. What's wrong with the world? And one day that great Christian philosopher, G.K. Chesterton, wrote... And he said, to the editor, the Times of London, you ask, what is wrong with the world? I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And with that letter to the editor, not one single letter was ever sent again because everyone got it. He nailed it. We live in a very self-centered Christian culture today. Over 40 years ago when I came to Christ, I can remember going to, a, the, I think it was called the Better Book Room in Wichita, Kansas. It was a Christian bookstore. Man, they had, I just, uh, I, 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 I bought books. I mean, they were, they were so, you go on today and unfortunately you see trinkets and this and the other and I'm not making light of it. I'm just saying we live in a, very self-centered Christian culture. Forget the world, Christian culture. That's my opinion today. And you know why? There is the almost elimination of the holiness of God. And the reason is because when you major <clears throat> and see the holiness of God, all of a sudden, things start coming apart in our lives. But they come apart in a good way, like Isaiah. He said, I'm undone. But let me close by saying, and I know you're sitting here on a wonderful, bright 80-degree day today. And those of you that are watching by your fireplace with your hot chocolate, I want to close by this. You're listening to me. But it's possible to come to church every Sunday and listen to me and wind up taking your last breath and splitting hell wide open. You know, one of the unfortunate things today <clears throat> that, that I think if I've, if, this is just what I think. I remember my dad, uh, you know, my dad was born in 1918. He died in 2014, 96 years of age. You know, when, when he was a, a kid, he, and he did a good job with this with me. He said, you know, his, uh, his mother, father, they, 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 did, they didn't repeat themselves. If they warned you, they followed through on it. You know what's happened over the years, or should I say over the decades? Well-meaning people who love their kids say, when I get you home, and they get home and nothing ever happens. Or they go to school and a teacher may say something or they have rules and, or a coach or whatever. 
and they don't follow through on what they say. And a kid grows up. And you see, listen, men, a child views God through their father. Follow through on everything that you say. And I want to close by telling you one thing about a holy God. He follows through with his word. He means what he says. He says he loves you. He says he sent his son to the cross so that you can go to heaven. But he said there's only one way. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There's only one way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. And you know the trick of the devil is that he gets people to say, oh, that's, yeah, I need that. That sounds good. And we tack it on to our life. And so we take Jesus and we think at the same time, well, I need to live this certain way and that in order to get to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven. Now listen carefully. God says, when you come to the end of your life and you draw your last breath, God says, I want you to understand I love you and I want you to spend eternity with me. But I want you to understand there's only one way that's going to take place and that is when you admit you're a sinner and you need a Savior and you receive him as your Savior and as your Lord. I say with great conviction because as I speak right now, I remember a cold, snowy Kansas City morning in 1975 when by myself in my bedroom, Debbie had gone to work. I knew, I knew for the very first time I was on my way to hell. Debbie didn't, I did. I told her the night before, Deb, if I die, I'm going to hell. And it threw her for a loop because she thought I was a Christian. And it, depending on when you asked me, I'd, I'd answer a certain way. But boy, thank goodness that God convicted me and I saw him as a holy God that means what he says and that he loved me. I knew that without Christ, I was going to hell. But that morning... I simply asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, and bring me into his forever family. And 46 years later, I stand here today, and I tell you, I still stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. But he does, and he did. And I say this, if you were to draw your last breath sometime this week, are you absolutely confident you'd go to heaven? If not, you got one of two choices. Either stay the way you are, or today, settle it once and for all. And know when you walk out of here, know when you put your head on your pillow tonight, you're on your way to heaven 
and the holy God of this universe loves you. You're his child. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, even if you're watching live stream, even if you're watching during the week, don't turn it off. Would you just bow your head and listen to me? If you have never genuinely settled your eternal destiny, if you've never truly asked Jesus Christ and invited him into your life to be your Savior and your Lord, would you do it now? Here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. And whether you're in this worship center or listening or watching, I'll pray out loud. You pray just between God and you. Let me lead you. You pray. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner and I know I need a Savior. Thank you, God, for loving me and for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I open my heart to you this very moment. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you. I choose you as my Savior and as my Lord. I trust nothing and no one but you, Jesus for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer and forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are still bowed, please, no one looking. If just then you prayed and you meant it, forget who, forget anybody's here. Forget that you're in your living room, wherever you are. If just then you prayed and you meant it, would you do me a favor? In a moment, would you, when I ask, just slip your hand up. And by doing, you say, Ken, I settled it today. I meant it. I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. Would you slip it wherever you are? Just slip it up and take it down. Today I prayed, God bless you. Someone else listening to me, watching me, at your TV, at your computer, in the car. If you'd ask Christ to come into your life today, man, thank goodness, we're a part of God's forever family. And if you don't have a church home, I'd love to invite you to Northwest Bible here in Hilliard. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today more than anything in the world, I thank you for who you are. Thank you for your mercy, for your forgiveness that those week after week have experienced here in our services. Thank you most of all that you are holy, absolute perfection not a trace of sin. Thank you, God, that you can be trusted. And may we be determined more than ever to simply let our lives count for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.